Hello, and welcome to Public Key, the podcast from Chainalysis. This is your host, Ian Andrews. If you're listening to this podcast, then you've probably already heard a lot about the Ronin Bridge hack, or the attack on the wormhole protocol, and probably the ransomware attack against Colonial Pipeline. But have you heard about the scam that hit tens of thousands of MetaMask users and resulted in the theft of over $200 million worth of crypto? In this episode, I'm joined by my colleagues from the Chainalysis Investigations team, Adam Hart and Julia Hardy. We recorded just after they returned from presenting their research at DevCon Bogota, the biggest gathering of Ethereum developers this year. We get into the mechanics of the scam, the investigative process, and the enthusiasm from the Ethereum community to help solve this problem. For more on this topic and all things crypto, start planning your trip to New York for the Chainalysis Links Conference, April 4th and 5th, 2023. And because I'm sure your crypto bags are a little bit lighter than the last time we held this conference, I've authorized 50% off tickets through the end of December. So go get your ticket today before prices go up in January. No special code required, just head to the link in the show notes. Today we've got an exciting episode. I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Julia Hardy, Adam Hart. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much. Now, you two are fresh off a trip to Bogota, Colombia, where one of the biggest crypto events of the year happened, DevCon. Julia, tell us a little bit about this conference. What was going on down there in Colombia? It was a really amazing conference. I feel like it's one of the more infamous of the Ethereum conferences, and there are probably about 6,000 people there, all different backgrounds, definitely a lot of engineers, but also some security-minded people, some people who are really working on furthering the space, and we heard a lot about some new ideas for where Ethereum could head. I think in general, there's a really good mindset with the conference. It's not really a hype conference, and it was really focused on how can we actually further the community and make this a long-term mainstream kind of a blockchain. Yeah, I I hear in contrast to some of the retail investor focused crypto conferences where they're giving away Lamborghinis and it's all flash and glitz and party. This one was much more focused on the core developer audience, people actually working directly on the chain or important projects to extend the ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I think the only hype was that we all have to get our po-ops now. (laughs) (laughs) So the presentation that you all gave down there, uh, we wanted to bring you on the show and talk about it because I think it it is very much of the day, which is talking about security in Web3 and and what seems like a growing problem, particularly following October. This year, there's been $3 billion worth of funds stolen from DeFi protocols. Adam, maybe kick us off with like kind of a a summary of some of these findings. So again, I think it was really wonderful to present about this topic at DevCon in particular, because frankly, there there are a lot of people in the room working to build products, whether it's a wallet, whether it's an application, to try and mitigate some of these problems. But really, the big picture problem we focused on is in order for Ethereum to grow and DeFi Web3 to be adopted, users need to be protected from the bad actors who are stealing all their money. And we we focused more so not on the one-off sort of lone wolf type scammers or, or little things, but the coordinated, sophisticated adversaries who tend to cause a lot of the damage. So on one hand, you know, to be very brief here, on one hand, you have very organized groups, maybe state-sponsored groups, Lazarus comes to mind, the North Korean affiliated groups, and they have certainly earned themselves a lot of headlines by breaking into some of the most well-known DeFi protocols out there and making off with hundreds of millions of dollars at a go. The most infamous of these hacks probably being the Axie Infinity Bridge hack, where they made off with upwards of $600 million. So we talked a little bit about that, but the majority of our presentation was actually focused on another type of, I would argue, sophisticated, coordinated adversary that maybe doesn't get quite as much attention. Because frankly, within the Web3 community, the threat of the North Korean actors, the threat of these known actors, while it's still a really serious problem, it's at least known. People know it's out there. People know that it exists. So we wanted to focus on something that maybe didn't get as much attention, which is the threat of coordinated scammers, essentially. And we we took folks through a case study where we really delved into 
a scam reported by MetaMask that MetaMask noticed a pattern. They reported a series of addresses that were scamming users out of what they thought was 60 to $80 million. And then we bit, did a bit of analysis and broadened that picture to say, you know, at the very least, users had lost upwards of $200 million, which would put this one sort of scam campaign in the same tier as those really high profile, really well known bridge hacks. But, you know, it definitely flies under the radar a little bit because it's not one victim, it's tens of thousands of victims, and each one is losing a little bit. But if Web3 is going to be adopted, those are the people you need to protect. And those are the people who need to not be losing money in their first experience in cryptocurrency. And I think this story is incredible. We're going to get more into detail on it. Julia, a question for you. I, I'm curious because I think my perception is Chainalysis and some of the investigative work that we've done, at times the crypto community has been a little bit either skeptical of why we're, we're looking into this or potentially we've seen people who've argued, hey, you're breaking the core premise of crypto, which is full anonymity, no oversight of regulators, you know, no opportunity for law enforcement to to stop bad actors. We've obviously been on the other side of that, which is protecting end users, protecting businesses, trying to operate legitimately in the space. But it hasn't always been well received. You know, you're at this core crypto developer conference, 6,000 people. What was the response to this presentation? It was pretty amazing because I was pretty nervous about some of that maybe more negative reception. Um, I've definitely been aware of that in the past, but this was a really positively received presentation. And I think the reason for that is that what we were really focusing on and what our main message at the end of the day was, it's not us against you, or it's not that it has to be law enforcement or not. It's that we should all be working together from the wallet providers through all the different protocols that users interact with through if there's any on-chain activity that we really want to delve into that's where we can come in and really add that extra insight between any attributions we have and just our knowledge of how to approach this kind of activity and look to potential cash out points so having this idea of having the web3 community all work together from start to finish and through that kind of involvement we can probably have a much more significant impact against some of these coordinated adversaries. And ultimately, I think that collaborative kind of approach was something that other people are interested in. And that's how we ended up with a much more positive reception. That's awesome to hear. I think the point you just made there about, look, we're all part of this community. We're all trying to grow it. We're trying to bring more users in. We're trying to ultimately improve people's lives, I think, through better access to the financial system. But if the outcome is you get scammed, you lose your NFTs, you lose your Ethereum, that's bad for all of us. It doesn't matter whether you're developing a protocol or working on the core Ethereum network. Nobody wants that to happen. Adam, going back to this MetaMask scam you mentioned, talk to me about what was the end user perception on, on this? I think this was a phishing attack. Talk a little bit about what, what was actually going on there. Yeah, correct. So the actual attack here is nothing fancy. It's nothing new. It is what we call approval phishing, which we don't need to get into the details there, but roughly the users are being shown a message by someone they trust, and they're clicking on a button that allows a bad actor to move tokens that are sitting in their wallet. And this approach, again, it's been around since the ICO days, since 2017, 2018. I'm sure it was been around even before then. What was interesting here is that MetaMask as a wallet provider had kind of unique insight. MetaMask, again, is a wallet provider. So they really provide software, free software, that allows users to manage their cryptocurrency, control their cryptocurrency directly. And in the wake of FTX, obviously, there, there's been a big shift towards these self-custody solutions. Uh, but in order for these self-custody solutions to work, users have to be able to understand what they're seeing and, and not get fished in this way. So what MetaMask noticed, and in, in their efforts to try and help their community, they have sort of a support system. They noticed that a lot of their users, their, the users of their software, were sending them tickets that said, hey, I've been scammed. And the pattern was roughly the same every time. The pattern was... Someone that they met on the internet, someone that they knew, maybe directed them to this site. And the site said, hey, you've got some tether. If you stake this tether or if you use it for tether mining, you can earn really nice rewards. Don't worry, the tether's not actually leaving your wallet. You never have to send the tether anywhere. You just have to approve it to take advantage of this exciting investment opportunity. Now, again, to experienced crypto folks, that's obviously 
not a legitimate investment because you, you can't mine anything <laughs> tether. But again, if you're, if you're a new user, if you're someone who's just trying this for the first time, that sounds great. You've heard you can make a little bit of money with crypto. You don't have to send it anywhere. You're, you're trying to do your basic due diligence. And that's how a lot of users sort of ended up falling for this scheme. The first sign of a scam is when it's too good to be true. I can do nothing and make money? Yes, please. Exactly. <laughs> Don't click approve on that button, anyone listening to this. Like, if you've got something that sounds too good to be true, it's probably a scheme or a scam in crypto. Now, Julia, so I think the thing that was unique about this story to me was that MetaMask actually attempted to take some action to help people stop running into this scam. Like, what happened after they started getting all these reports? They actually created some good documentation of what they were seeing to try to spread the awareness about these kind of mining scams. So they had a Twitter thread that went along with a blog post that they had that was outlining what are some of the front ends that you might be seeing that maybe aren't true. And then they, along with that, created a Dune dashboard that really summarized all the activity that they were seeing. So what were some of the addresses that were reported as being a target when it came to actually getting those approvals? Where were the recipients of the stolen funds? Who were the victims? And just getting some larger data points to help to spread that word. And I think that was really nice for us as a jumping off point because we were able to have a good overview of what kind of activity are we seeing both off-chain and on-chain. Um, we were actually able to speak with them directly to even gain some further insights there. And we really used that as the basis for how we could approach a further investigation. It looks like MetaMask saw initially 60 addresses that were kind of part of the scam network and about $83 million was stolen between October of 21 and October of this year, roughly. But I think when we went and took a closer look at them, like the network was actually quite a bit larger than that. Yeah. And that's where I think to Julia's larger point, this is where collaboration between different bits of the community can be really helpful to understand these bad actors because MetaMask, they have sort of the ground truth there. They have users telling them this is a problem. And then MetaMask did the incredible job and hard work of aggregating that, filtering in on, you know, sort of what is the core issue here and then sharing that information with the community. So then what we could do is take those 60 addresses and then do basically what all blockchain analysts do, which is just look for patterns. So we, we looked for a variety of patterns. We found a few different patterns because, frankly, if you're an organized group scamming people out of hundreds of millions of dollars, you're going to have some sort of standard procedures. And we can follow those standard procedures based on how addresses behave on chain and map out the larger network. And it turns out it wasn't just 60 addresses. It was far more than 60 addresses. And as we analyzed the greater number of addresses, we were able to, with confidence, assess that it wasn't $83 million that were stolen. It was just over $220 million. That is definitely a lower bound estimate of we're confident it's $220 million. It's probably much larger than that. That's incredible. And Julia, so if I'm understanding, so I, I'm kind of like going around on the internet, I see this ad or a message that's like, hey, you've got Tether, you know, you can stake your Tether, no risk, earn a mining reward, which makes no sense if you're like way deep into crypto. But if you're a casual crypto person, like, hey, that's a great offer. Let me prove this. What happens from there with these funds? Like, where were they going after this initial approval? Yeah, we saw a pattern of activity that's pretty common with, you've heard it called a romance scam, a pig butchering scam, um, in this case, a mining investment kind of scam. But these tether scam activities are really similar. And what they're really doing is they're gathering all these different funds from different victims. They're consolidating them together to a number of different addresses within that scam network. And then they're starting to get them ready for cash out points. So they're starting to move them towards their different addresses that are going to be depositing into a number of traditionally Asian-based exchanges. And the numbers there can really be staggering when you just see how much is flowing to even a single deposit address. I think one that we found was $38 million going to a single deposit address at a specific exchange. So once you're following those funds, after a few hops, as we call it, you really get to the meat of where those cashettes are and where we see all of that aggregated stolen funds heading. 
Do we have any sense of how much the scammers in this case were actually able to cash out? We don't right now, so that would really be the next step would be if we were to pursue this further, if we were to potentially have law enforcement involved, then we could see what's the other side after it hit the exchange. In some of the investigations I know we get involved in, depending on the token, like there's a number of different ways in which the situation plays out. Like with USDC as an example, the center organization behind issuing that token has the ability to freeze stolen funds. So if there's a law enforcement report, they go through a whole process, but they can freeze those funds on chain, which sort of defeats the purpose of stealing them in the first place, right? The attacker never really gets away with anything. In other cases, like I know with Axie Infinity, we've been able to identify when when the attacker has moved funds to an exchange in an attempt to, to cash out. We've alerted the exchange change and they've actually been able to freeze those funds and we've seen some of that be returned back to the victims in that case but in in this metamask scam it sounds like maybe the attacker was actually successful in getting away with at least some portion of the funds. Is that the right understanding? Yeah, that's unfortunately true. I think part of the difference between those two is is the level of awareness from the general crypto community and from law enforcement. So with all of the Ronin funds, there has been thousands of eyes looking at each address, monitoring when something is heading to an exchange and the exchanges themselves are also very aware. So there's a lot of different people who can work together versus with this scam that we were looking into, most people didn't even know it existed until that MetaMask article came out and then potentially until our presentation. And so there's no real group to to make sure that those funds can really be stopped in time. And I think that's something that we're hoping can be a changed message in the coming months and maybe into next year if we can try to see if we have the right people in place to get every type of illicit activity prevented from cash outs. And to chime in on that one, there's also the factor of big bridge hacks, those happen at one instant in time and everyone's paying attention. Whereas this scam happened over the course of the year and it's not from one entity, it's all these victims, each one, maybe they report it to their local police department, maybe they report it to to MetaMask, but it's not, you know, one coordinated report. So it's like, again, it's a lot easier to try and get away with $5,000 that you stole from one person, you know, somewhere in the world than it is to get away with $600 million that you stole from a single organization that's going to bring, you know, every resource they have at their disposal down on top of you. That makes a ton of sense, Adam. I mean, it kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the ransomware work that we were doing last year where NetWalker was able to run for two years because they were hitting kind of local hospital systems in cities all around North America and Europe. So each individual attack was relatively small, rarely made the news. And then until kind of someone looked at the aggregate of all the attack activity and realized it was millions of dollars, kind of a single coordinated network of uh, attackers that caught the attention of law enforcement. So this seems very similar, right? It's not just Lazarus stealing hundreds of millions of dollars at once. It's a series of attacks over a year period. Each one is individually relatively small. And I guess at least leads me to the question of, well, do we have any idea at this point who's behind this work? Because you you said it is organized and coordinated. Do we have a guess? I don't think we can speak to this specific case, but there is some very great reporting out there in the public on this typology of scam. So there's some great pieces in Wired as well, sort of exploring how these pig butchering cases work. And I know we've had them on a previous episode of Public Kia, but I think that's sort of the probably the best way to, to understand the type of group, at least, that's behind this sort of attack. I won't press you on that. Point taken. Investigation ongoing. Yeah, we did have Alistair from Vice News joined us to talk about some of these pig butchering scams. So we'll link back to that episode because that's almost an unbelievable conversation of what's going on there. Kind of the scale of the industrialized operation scam activity happening out of Cambodia, Laos, and, and Myanmar. So it sounds like maybe there's there's a suspicion, at least the pattern of behavior is, is similar here. I'm curious, Julia, coming out of the DEVCON conference, 
you know, is there any discussion around kind of an industry level coordination to help try and prevent this? Because it, it seems like it's not enough to say, well, users need to get smarter. They need to know that you don't mind Tether, therefore don't approve this. Like that probably unreasonable. We're always going to have users that are less sophisticated than the most advanced crypto user. We can't set the bar. At, you must be an expert to even participate. But it does seem like potentially working across different layers of the ecosystem from the protocol providers and DeFi to the wallet providers, to you know, investigative analysis, security tools uh, like chain analysis, there's an opportunity to shut off a lot of the potential for theft and scams. Did any of that discussion happen at the conference? Yeah, definitely. And I think that you bring up a really good point that was also being discussed at the conference, which is we can't assume that every single user is going to be able to know how the ecosystem works in great detail and even potentially be able to custody their own crypto. Not everyone is meant to have that private key themselves and some people are meant to use an exchange. And there is a lot of discussion of how do we make the experience safe and easier to use in in general. And I think a lot of the discussion of what can we all do about it was really focused on trying to establish some kind of partnerships. So one that was mentioned during the conference was that MetaMask and OpenSea have been working really closely together because there's a lot of people who their first use case is to buy an NFT. And so they don't know really about the wallet part. They don't really know about what they're approving on the OpenSea side. And if there can be greater education and working together there, there can potentially be prevention of NFT thefts. And on our side, we've been looking into the potential to try to see if we can work with either on the wall provider side or some of the like on-chain monitoring kind of people, even maybe some of the auditing to just see if there is some kind of uniform um, way that we can try to have that end-to-end security um, like we were discussing. That brings us around to one of my favorite topics to complain about, which is Discord. So Adam, in in the presentation you all gave, you you did mention that there's this particular category of scam activity that relates to Discord as the engagement vector. Can you talk about that a little bit? I think we've seen some pretty prolific thefts of, of popular NFTs through that platform. Yeah, certainly. There are quite a few that, that spring to mind and some, some pretty iconic tweets that might go along the lines of all my apes gone, uh, which is, you know, is always a nice headline. I think the root cause of that issue, and, and it's not just Discord, it's also some other, you know, sort of trusted forms of, of media, Twitter, whatever other official forums. But, you know, the goal of the attacker there is really Discord is popular in the crypto community. It's a considered a safe channel for communication. And what they do is try various means to get a hold of a Discord server or maybe one of the posters in that Discord channel who, who is trusted by the community. And then they'll post a link to an exciting investment opportunity. In the NFT community, maybe that's an opportunity to mint new NFTs. But again, the purpose here is they're impersonating something that sounds legitimate, right? They're they're saying something that, that might one day happen, right? It's not unheard of for an NFT project to come out with new NFTs. That's pretty expected. And then people race to click the link. They don't think about what they're clicking on. And before they know it, you know, all their apes are gone. That's right. You got to rush to get on the wait list. You got to rush to mint. Maybe you get an airdrop opportunity. Like there's such high fear of missing out. It kind of sets people up in a mode where, where they're almost primed for these more elegant or sophisticated phishing attacks. As a general rule, again, for all our listeners, if someone DMs you on Discord, chances are it's a scam. If they send you a link, don't click it. Even if you think you know who you're talking to. Just don't go out of band, try and communicate with them some other means. And I think it'll shut some of this down. And you're right. I like to pick on Discord personally, but that's that's by no means the source of, of the compromises in many of these cases. It, it's simply a communication factor. I'm thinking as we kind of come to the close on the conversation, you two are professional investigators here at Chainalysis. You're working on some incredible cases, many of which don't even get discussed in public, but I spend probably too much time on Twitter. And I see there's all sorts of amateur investigators who, you know, they're diving into Etherscan or one of the other kind of block explorer tools trying to do transaction analysis. Like if one of those folks had the opportunity to ask for advice, how do they get to where the two of you are? Julia, maybe you want to start, like, how do you get into this profession and build up the skills and, and expertise that you have? 
Yeah, we love seeing all of the Twitter investigators. I definitely see what they're up to. I would say in general, it's a willingness to constantly learn. I think every single week I'm figuring out how does this protocol work and what does it look like on chain and and just doing that research all of the time. So I think that's a really important step. I think the other thing is to really ask questions. It can be really easy to take a label that you see at face value or hear that everyone else is pointing in one direction so that must be the way but a lot of our biggest investigative successes have been when we've actually questioned that and tried to look for other routes and figured out that this was actually the key to whatever cracking the code we needed so those would be my main points of advice Great advice. And Adam, I know you've spent the last two years actually training people. So what's the best way to get started in your opinion? Like how can people kind of launch into this world of crypto investigations? It's certainly been an interesting one sort of hearing from investigators, both both on and off Twitter around the world. But to Julia's point, again, I just think curiosity is is number one. The most successful investigators you see are, are often the ones who are most curious. And then frankly, being comfortable reaching out to random people. The crypto community is really, really helpful uh, in almost all cases. People are really willing to help new people, folks getting into the space, folks starting with investigations, and maybe they don't respond to you the first time, but it's worth you know sending that question over Twitter to that random investigator that you follow who's more established. And then lastly, I think using the products that you're investigating actually helps quite a bit because if you understand the user experience, then maybe you can understand some of the bad actor activity as well. That's a great point. You got to actually be in the ecosystem and using the technology in order to really understand it and parse through some of the data. Well, Julia, Adam, thank you so much for taking the time. Next time, I'm going to try and join you down in Bogota. Looking forward to the next developer conference. Get to see this presentation in person. Appreciate the time today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Hey there, thanks for listening to another episode of Public Key. This is the last one for 2022, but we'll be back in January with season two. Before we head into the holiday break, I wanna thank everyone that subscribed to the show and especially anyone that sent me a review or a note of encouragement. It certainly means a lot. If you're listening and I haven't heard from you, go ahead. Right now, you can leave me a review or share an episode on your favorite social media platform. Tag me in the comment. I'm at Ian Andrews DC on Twitter. If you have some downtime during the next few weeks and you're looking to get smarter on crypto tech and policy, then head over to our recently relaunched YouTube channel. There's some great deep dive content, including episode one of our new show, Know Your Crypto Compliance, hosted by Clark Flynn Barr and Caitlin Barnett. Links for these pages can be found in the show notes.